Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, the, oops. Good afternoon. It's May 30th, 2024. This is meeting of the Budget Coordinating Group, a group that includes representatives from the Town Council, the Amherst School Committee, and the Jones Library Trustees. The open meeting law allows us to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. The meeting is accessible um, by Zoom and by phone. Given that we have a quorum of the budget coordinating group, I am calling this meeting to order at 103. I'm gonna call on each of you that are here and in the process, please indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you, and then we will proceed. Um, Andy Steinberg. Present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Councillor Lord. Present. And Lynn Griesmer, that, it, those are the people from the town council. From the library, uh, we have Bob Pam. Present. And also uh, Sharon Sherry, the director of the library. Here. And from the uh, schools, we have Bridget Hines. Here. Sarah Marshall. Here. And then also from the town, we have Sandy Pooler. Here. Jennifer LaFontaine. Here. Athena O'Keefe. I'm here. And uh, um, Paul Bachelman. Okay. And I'm here. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Please use the raised hand button if you would like to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, and uh, if we have technical difficulties, we'll decide what to do with that. Um, we are going to have a, a public comment, but before I start that, um, on June 3rd at 6.30, the Town Council hold it, holds its public forum on the proposed capital improvement program, followed by the town a Town Council meeting. Uh, if you are in the audience and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. I just want to note that there's only one person in the audience at this time. And so we are going to proceed uh, since they have not raised their hand. Um, the real purpose of this meeting is to look at projections over the next three to five years with regard to the overall budget for the town of Amherst, which covers library schools and the town. Um, to look at the overall revenue projections, the impact of the requested 6% increase by the regional schools, and what what it would look like if it was a four four percent uh, increase and a two percent one time gift. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul Bachelman and I believe Sandy Pooler. Thanks, Lynn. So, if you recall, when we first when the council first set the financial guidelines um, in back in the fall, the um, the guidance was for a three percent basically increase. And then we came back after Sandy got on board and, and looked at our books again, and we were able to move that up to 4% back in February, I think it was. Um, you know, as we're all aware of the discussion about the needs of the school district and how the school committee has voted a budget that was um, was at a 6% level, um, we thought it was important for this group to reconvene to share with you what these increases look like over time, because these are not one-year decisions, especially when you don't have a recurring source of revenue to support some of the things. It's really important for us to maintain the financial stability of the town. So I think and, uh, Sandy has done some projections. And Sandy, if you want to um, share some of that, those numbers, and then we can talk about this further. All right, can you all see this spreadsheet? Very good. So um, you've seen this spreadsheet before. It, this is just the uh, FY25 budget and the forecast that goes along with it. We have the revenues at the top, the expenditures down at the bottom. Um, and this uh, is a balanced budget right now. It shows uh, in this instance, the uh, 
war budgets going up by 4%. Um, and we have a balanced budget uh, for FY25. And then right now we have uh, deficits of 430, 540,000, 670,000, 820,000 in the future. Um, so first I'd just like to talk about the current scenario uh, and what I see as the probabilities of these deficits into the future. Um, one of the things about forecasts is that there usually are deficits somewhere in the future. That's not something to be worried about. I think you will see that almost all the time. Uh, one of the things about this forecast is that it assumes in the future that we will have new growth of $650,000 a year. Uh, historically, that new growth has been higher for the town. It's been 900,000 to a million dollars. Uh, and if that is the case, um, then it will wipe out most, excuse me, wipe out most of this deficit um, going forward. So under the current scenario, I'm not too worried about um, deficits in the future. On the other hand, uh, it also assumes some things that may not be true. It assumes in this forecast, which I took from the forecast that had been presented in the past, that spending on the four major budget areas would go up by only two and a half percent. Um, so you know, that may or may not be true, but um, that's the base assumption here. I am going to present in a minute a number of other assumptions uh, that uh, Paul talked about a second ago. But before I get into those other scenarios, I would just like to ask if people have any questions about the current forecast, uh, the one I have on the screen, which was also presented in the manager's budget um, and is consistent with prior forecasts. Sarah, I see you have your hand up. Yes, just to ask if you can blow it up a little bit, if we don't need to see all the years, or even if we do, that will help. <laughs> thank, help me. thank you, that, thank you very much. Okay. That was all. Whoops. All right. Councillor Haneke. Uh, on a similar vein, will we be able, will we be sent these spreadsheets that you put online? Um, will they be posted in a packet or something so that we can really investigate them and look at them much more closer than during this meeting when I can only see about half the spreadsheet? Half, I don't even see the 4% and 2.5% on your screen, for example. So yeah. I, I know I, I have this one in paper because this is the one in the budget. But when you get to modifying these, will we get copies of them? What I'll do is I will uh, have, I'll send it to Athena and have her send it to you guys. Any other questions or comments? All right, let's get to the fun stuff then, the scenarios. Can everybody see this all right? Are this, is this big enough? Okay. So here's our current scenario, same numbers as on the previous screen. I then uh, started by adding 355, 440 to the regional budget and assuming that we would have another revenue source, so something such as ARPA, uh, so we'd still have a balanced budget in FY25. Um, but then we would have uh, deficits uh, so in this scenario, I kept that 355 in uh, the budget going forward. If it's not, if it's just a one-time thing, I, I can show that scenario, but it would um, it would bring it back closer to the numbers that we have up here. But if we keep it in the regional budget, then the deficits look like these. Okay. The next thing I did is I said, uh, starting with the current uh, assumption of two and a half percent increase, I said, well, what if we went to 3% growth for all uh, the budgets? Uh, again, keeping the regional budget at the 4% level, 
uh, in FY25 uh, and, as, and as opposed to going up more. So with all these scenarios, you can mix and match one assumption or another. But I just wanted to see what things looked like if we had a 3% growth in spending over time. Um, in 26, it uh, doesn't get that big, but by FY29, it gets to be two and a half million dollars. Um, so that starts to be a significant uh, gap. So that even if with new growth, we were to get rid of say the, the deficit in 26 now, if we were growing at 3%, it would still be you know probably uh, a $400,000 deficit, which we'd have to deal with next year, but then it really does start to get a lot bigger. The next scenario I went to was, we had an almost 0% increase in our retirement assessment this year. So the question was, if in FY26, we return to the norm uh, and make up for the fact that in this year, we had that zero increase. My uh, assumption here was what would happen if in FY26, just for one year, retirement assessment went up to 10% and then stayed at 6% for these out years. That would have these deficits um, that you know would look like this. And then finally I said, well, what if instead of a two and a half percent increase every year, we had a 4% growth just as we had this year? What would those things look like? So that would be a deficit anywhere from one and a half million dollars to almost six million dollars. So what does this tell me? Um, it shows that um, we need to have some discussions and some more, I think, what if planning about where we see revenue going and spending going. Uh, in particular, uh, in Amherst and throughout the state, there have been um, problems this year with school budgets um, where the requests for school budget increases have been way above what the average increase in revenue have been for many communities. You've seen it in um, Northampton, you've seen it in Brookline, you've seen it uh, you know, in dozens, but I can just think of those two as other communities that very much value uh, education, but are, have been running into problems and how they deal with it, you know, um, they're still working out, but there's a big gap between the ask and the available resources. What I looked at here in this line is with this revenue scenario under the current assumption, what's the annual revenue growth? Um, and so for FY26, it would be 2.8%. For 27, it'd be 3.3. For 28, it'd be 3.8. And for 29, it'd be 3.1. Um, I'm not sure why there's this little bump in 28, but in any case, uh, there you have it. Um, so it tells me that Amherst, in general, grows between about 3 and 3.5%. So if there's going to be spending more than that, we're going to have some revenue gaps. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about what other revenue sources might be available from the state. Um, but before I do that, I thought, thought I would stop for a second and take any questions. I see hands popping up. So. Um, I will, if I may, uh, Lynn, I will call on people. Uh, Sarah Marshall. Yeah, thank you. Just, I want to be sure I'm understanding in, so these versions, for example, 3% growth and 4% growth, that's across all departments or is this just for regional schools or? That, that, that's for all four, town, region, elementary, and library. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Hannigan, Joe. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> I noticed that all of these scenarios talk about increases in the expenditure side. Um, but you just talked about that our new growth number at 650 going across the board might be a little low. Um, do you have scenarios that increase the allocated potential revenue side? Like by what does, if we estimate instead of new growth every year at 650, if we estimate new growth at 900, because that's where it's been, what do these numbers then look like with those changes too? Or okay. are there, beyond new growth, are there other places where our estimates for revenues are maybe a bit too conservative? Um, so I'm gonna go back to this scenario. Uh, I'm gonna say that in general, um, I think it's a good idea to um, keep new growth estimates low. Um, one thing that I, for example, we did in Arlington when this same issue came up is we had sort of declining scale. So if the average of new growth had been 900,000, then we would do the next year like 800, 700, you know, 650, something like that. Um, it is possible, you know, you're never guaranteed new growth if there's a downturn in the economy. Um, and so forth. So I I think it is possible to play with those numbers. I, I do think it would behoove the town to look at your long-term new growth numbers, um, to look at what's on the table now for development that's been proposed. You can look at the number of um, building permits that have been taken out talk to the assessor, talk to the building inspector and the planning department. And, uh, you know, you can look at what's on the horizon. Uh, you know, again, in other communities I've been in, there's sometimes been a, like a subgroup of BCG that just is uh, assigned to talk about revenue and look at those trends. So I think new growth is one you could look at I don't see a lot of potential for changes in local receipts because frankly, you don't, there aren't that many that you can really change that are gonna raise a lot of money. I mean, you're not, you can double the cost of maps, but that's really not gonna change anything. Uh, state aid is the other one where, um, you know, we have some fairly low estimates of state aid growth, a half a percent, for chapter 70, um, and, and th th these are all based on the governor's budget, uh, and we had 3% for, for UGA. Um, I think uh, the chapter 70 number could go up a little bit in the future. Um, this year in the House budget, it was higher, and in the, in the Senate budget, it was higher, but it was higher by, um, you know, it's like up by, I think, 100,000 or, or something like that. It's not going to be a major change. And UGA is never really going to get much more than that 3%. And those other things aren't, aren't big enough. So because Amherst has declining enrollment, um, their Chapter 70 numbers really aren't going to change that much. And, and that's those are really the sources. So um, yes, you I think it, again, behooves that the town to have a discussion among the BCG members or some, some, some committee working with the staff to look at what trends are in local receipts and new growth and uh, so forth. And then um, see if you wanna tweak these numbers. Uh, I don't see huge potential for, for changes that way. Uh, Councillor Andy Steinberg. So several things. <laughs> well, thank you, but several things I thought about. One is, is, is I understood the retirement line here uh, on this chart. I just flipped back to it. 
what you're what you're assuming on that chart is that the uh, one year uh, gain that we had this year because of the timing of the um, when the assessment is done, um, that it's going to catch up with us and cause us to have a one year increase next year that is greater. And then we're going to institutionalize that number going forward. If that's likely, isn't that something that should be combined into the base assumptions so that it, uh, when you look at the 4% and 3% increases, that it already um, adjusts for that, for that factor across the board? Um, I, uh... As I was talking about in these scenarios, I think more than one thing is possible at a time. So yes, I think um, combining, let's say the 3% with the retirement, so the 3% adds about another $400,000 and uh, the retirement for one year adds about another $300,000. So if you put this together, you, uh, you'd have on top of this 800,000, another 300 there. So you'd be at about a million dollar deficit in FY26. Uh, yes, that, I, I guess, yeah, you can decide when you want to build that in. And, and I, I think that is a sort of a decision for the BCG to make as to how pessimistic or optimistic your assumptions want to be. Uh, and then, you know, give the staff some feedback about that. Uh, you, you might even say we're going to have, you know, a pessimistic and an optimistic forecast going forward and then update them as, as time goes along. Um, but I think it would not be unreasonable uh, to, you know, build that in, to build in adding the 355 to the region uh, and again, kind of best case, worst case scenario, you could do it as a one-time thing or you could build it into the future. Um, I try to keep things discreet today at this level so that people could kind of in their own mind see what this would look like. But I think in the future, it would be helpful for BCG to see those things played out again on a range of kind of best case to worst case scenarios. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. And I think that that's the question is I just was trying to fix on this because uh, we may be looking at the lines then and not recognizing the fact that there is that cumulative possibility. I think it's more than a possibility. I think to some extent it's a likelihood on the retirement and the combination and we may be too conservative in our looking at the uh, projections. Um, the other things, of course, are uh, that I was just going to mention is uh, there's still a Municipal Empowerment Act and the possibility that we might be able to start um, assessing motor vehicle excise tax increases. Uh, it, uh, or that, that might have some effect. I, I will show you those numbers in a second. I, I okay. held off on showing those, but I do, I have calculated those numbers. Okay, great. And of course, the other is uh, we know that the Chapter 70 is going to be in flux of legislatures. Uh, finally, um, if the Senate budget provision prevails, uh, likely to take a look at the chapter 70 calculations, though the falling enrollment doesn't help us, you're correct. So is my other points. Thanks. Sarah Marshall. Yeah, um, since this is my first time I'm here, I'm sorry if I'm asking, I'm the only one who doesn't know no, the answer please, to my question. <laughs> but so line three here, adding 355 to the region, is that what's the assumption? Is that a one time and doesn't affect the subsequent years, or it's you're adding it 
to the base. So the way I built it, it would this is a permanent increase. Oh, okay. Um, so that would mean um, you could take you could essentially take that um, three fifty five out of these numbers here, so they would look more like the numbers above. If it's just a one time, hit. right. Thank you. <clears throat> then Griezmann. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, Paul might be better able to answer this, but Sandy, you probably can. And that is that my uh, observation and my understanding has been that even though we do have some new growth, mostly by the building of additional um, apartments, if you will, um, that are significant. And some of them have really brought on some significant money. We tend to eat that up every year just by inflation in the budget. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not like Amherst is in a building boom or for that matter has land to have a building boom. Um, but I need to see if anybody wants to speak to that. I, uh, I will let Paul answer in a second, but I, I would say uh, your observation is generally correct. Um, and I think having some conversation or presentation, you know, from Rob Mora, you know, via Paul about that issue would be important at some point. Yeah, I would just add, I think that's, it's a, it's a good point, but we know what's in the pipeline, um, but we don't know how long that is that pipeline is continued going to continue to be primed because you know we do see downturns in construction activity as well, and there's limited land on which to build. So I think we're starting to see more and more marginal land developed. So um, I don't think this is a you know increasing the um, the new growth is a is a risk because we might not achieve it in future years. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, or reveal this, ta-da. Um, so this, there is a piece of legislation that the governor has filed, the Municipal uh, Improvement Act version two uh, that would allow uh, cities and towns to opt into various increases in their revenue. Uh, one would be a 5% increase in motor vehicle excise tax. And I looked at uh, what's in the forecast for motor vehicle excise as an assumption and increasing that by 5% would be an $87,000 increase. Increasing uh, the motel hotel tax by uh, an, an additional 1% would lead to $36,000 in additional revenue and increasing the meals tax from its current 0.75 to 1% going to the town would be $133,000. If you add them all up together, that's an increase of $250,000. That would be uh, sort of a one-time bump. Um, so you'd bump it up and then you could assume probably a certain amount of increase uh, in those things uh, along the same lines as we increase them now in the forecast, a, a, a few percent, you know, basically inflationary increases per year. Um, so if the legislature were to adopt that and the town were to adopt it, uh, you might start seeing that stuff affecting the revenue in FY26 for part of the year and really start to kick in in FY27 before you get the full brunt of it. Uh, but that that's the scale that we're talking about. Um, it would not wipe out the deficits that you see up on these screens in terms of increased spending, um, but you know it would certainly be a, a help on, on the revenue side. So I just wanna give you a sense of what I see as the scale of what the state is offering to cities and towns. And when you're talking to your legislative delegation, you know, 
this gives you a sense to tell them how important it would be to the town. Are there any questions about these numbers? Um, so I will go on and opine <laughs> uh, and say that um, I think getting a sense of where you would like to see spending going, whether you want to continue to assume that it's going to be two and a half percent or whether you think it's likely to go to three or four is something that this group needs to discuss and uh, at least get some sort of agreement on. Um, I think also uh, if, you, the, number two, you could play with the revenue assumptions and new growth and state aid and so forth and, and see if you want to tweak those things and see how they affect this. And then finally, um, I think at some point you need to look at whether uh, an override would solve these problems uh, and how big that override would be um, and whether you just do it to solve the problem for one year or do it like we did in um, in Amherst in which I think, excuse me, in Arlington, which I think uh, Northampton is doing now is have an override that's big enough to last for a few years before it gets all used up and then you have to look at another one but I think having those conversations amongst yourselves to see, all right, if our spending is at 3%, uh, how big an override would we have to have? Uh, at this point, um, you could have an override next spring and it would affect the 26 budget um, and you know how big that would be and, and so forth. And, and whether you think there's an appetite for that sort of thing. Um, and uh, or uh, but I do think a structured way of having those conversations is an essential conversation for the town to have. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if you are going to have, well, I guess I would say also, frankly, on the uh, on the regional side, regional enrollment peaked in 2003, and it has gone down 41% between then and now. Um, I think in talking to voters about overrides, there's going to have to be a very serious conversation about what the annual increases in the school's budgets have been, uh, taking into consideration these decreases in enrollment. Now, I don't have an opinion about that. In other words, I'm not saying you have to cut the school budget because enrollment has declined. That's a policy choice. And so that's for what for you people to make up your own minds about, not for me to make up my mind about. But I do think it's an important question that the voters are going to ask. Um, and I have yet to really see much discussion about that in town. Um, and so I, I think that really needs to happen. Uh, it, it goes hand in hand with questions about the structure of contract settlements. It goes hand in hand with questions about class sizes and the different kinds of programs that are offered and so on. Um, so uh, I, I just flag that as what I see as, as a key issue. And uh, again, I'll compare this to my experience in Arlington where we had rising enrollment every year. And so a part of the way we structured our budget was to say that there was a certain part of uh, town and school budget that could go up by inflation and the, and the BCG there or the equivalent set that number. And then there was a factor for school enrollment that raise the school budget in years when enrollment went up uh, by basically 50% of the average cost per student, and then lowered the budget or lowered the increases by that same 50% per student in years when enrollment went down. So um, 
there are ways to structure a long-term plan with something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just one of the ways to do it, but I, I do think it was a pretty good model for thinking about the impacts of enrollment on school budgets. So that was my little soapbox speech. <laughs> uh, and I will stop talking now. Yeah. Are there questions that, uh, yes, Sarah. Well, a comment and a, and a question, and maybe the question doesn't need to be answered now, but I, I only really have a hazy idea of how overrides work and for how long they last. And anyway, so so, so I, I, I'm going to need to understand that, um, but maybe offline. Um, and then I just want to repeat it. Uh, observation I made some years ago to the finance committee. I wasn't, I wasn't on school committee or anything. Um, I, I appreciate the, um, the wisdom of conservative budgeting, but at least at the time when I was looking at the town budgets, we were regularly ending with spending well below the revenue, which is good. That's, you know, you don't want to have exceeded it. But, but those dollars left on the table, you know, they really could have been used elsewhere, you know, because the kid is only in eighth grade once or only, you know, whatever. So, so I just, I just wonder if there's, if there's a way to dial back the conservatism a little bit so, um, so that there's more money available in the budget. Thank you. If I could reply to that for one second. Yes. So if money is unspent, um, you know, it may mean that there are vacancies or uh, and so forth um, in the town or school budgets. <laughs> um, the town, A, the town regularly turns back money. Uh, the school is almost never. So um, I think getting into a conversation about who's turning back money and why um, would be educational for the BCG and, and so forth. Um, the town has engaged in the practice, and I think the schools have too, of fully funding every position, um, assuming somebody's gonna be there for the full year, because they might be. And then during the year, you do have vacancies. Um, that, that is a very good, budgeting practice, and I would encourage the town to continue to do that. Um, so I don't, and, and then, you know, you do have free cash, it ends up uh, coming back to the town and then is either put into uh, your reserve funds or uh, the town has had the practice of putting some of that money into a capital stabilization fund and a reparations funds, the, those funds are used down the road. Um, so anyway, that's just my two cents on that. Yeah, I think I was thinking more of the revenue than the expense. <laughs> well, and I do think having a conversation in this yeah. group about how tight those revenue estimates are is a legitimate question to have. We just haven't gone through those numbers and any details, but I do think you need to. Okay. Councilor Hanke. I mean, yeah. Councilor Hannick is next. So I, I want to second the need to, you know, even this, the the chart that, that Sandy, you presented when it talks, it talks about a recap, but when we see, you know, and then it's an actuals, we never actually see on the revenue side, the actuals compared to the budget. Um, and so you have to try and find every year a different document and compare it to some other document that was produced 12 months later to figure out and hope to figure out whether the revenues that we were actually received were lower, higher, or right on target with what we budgeted. And producing a document year over year or one that has 10 years worth of those numbers that we could look at, I think would really help us discuss are we too tight in our budgeting revenues? Because, and 
what Sarah said has been a concern of some of our council, of us counselors. Are we losing opportunities on operating side because we are too conservative in our revenue estimation? Yes, it gets spent somewhere else, mainly capital, right? <laughs> because when it goes into free cash or, or stabilization, it's mostly used for our capital. Are we being too conservative on the revenue that we're losing operating opportunities. So I would definitely want to continue exploring that with the data that I know is there, but someone has to pull it together because it's not ever presented in a way where we can really easily digest it. Um, I had a couple of other comments. Um, it, can I just yeah. say one thing about that? Um, I know the comptroller produces a quarterly report and end of the year report that compares budget to actual. Those have been produced for several years. Pulling them all together in one place may be what needs to be done, but that information is publicly available. It's 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 nothing anybody is cares or tries to hide. Uh, so I would just say right off the bat, that's one source. And then whether it needs to be pulled together in some different format for people to look at is a is a good question. Yeah. No, I know we're not hiding it. It's just. <laughs> It's not really ever presented to the council during any of our budgeting discussions. It comes to finance once a year, well after we've passed the prior year's budget that has these actuals and recaps. But um, a couple of other comments. Uh, you know, you you asked about a discussion on where spending is going. Um, Finance Committee is finding out that even the four percent increase this year, um, given our discussions with departments, is hampering the operating budget of the municipal government. Um, we know inflation is very high, so I think, and, and still remains high. We lucked out for a while that that um, new growth plus two and a half percent levy kind of matched inflation for a while, but it's not anymore. And that's putting pressure on all four functional areas. Um, it might be better hidden by the municipal government and how it's how that budget is presented, but the pressures are there. Finance committee is hearing of them from um, department heads that say, we just don't have enough manpower to do what the council wants us to, or what we are trying to do. We need more personnel. We don't have enough manpower to um, complete the essentially un unfunded mandates at new regulations at the state and federal level. And so in order to comply with them, we are reducing what we're doing somewhere else, which is while we didn't reduce people, we're kind of reducing our services, um, things like that. And then there's inflation on top of that. Um, I, I don't see how we can say two and a half percent increase functional across the board is something that is sustainable um, with a level of service, if we want to keep the same level of services, even if we call it a level services, um, such that our future budget should probably look at three or four um, percent, even if we go across the board, that um, that is something that, or we have to be much more upfront in meetings that aren't attended by, what do we got? We got three, six, nine, thir three people of the public <laughs> about what those, what, what these numbers are, right? We have to do it in meetings that have a lot more um, people watching. To show that. So I, I think that's one thing I would say. Um, override, I think we absolutely do need to consider it. Um, I, I would ask, I, it, spring isn't our only option though. We have an election coming this fall. We could put that override potentially on any ballot, right? And then I guess my questions on that would be, um, how do we go about considering an amount to put on a ballot, uh, number one? And then number two, how do we go about dealing with the fact that some of our funding or some of our expenses need to be, in a sense, shared with three other towns? I struggle override and funding of regional schools because we're supposed to be equitably sharing the costs of the regional schools. And, and people can determine what equitable means, but, but there are state formulas and there are these formulas that even if we do an override, if the other towns aren't doing the same or putting in the same, um, we have to have a conversation that asks our own taxpayers and our own elected officials, is it 
okay potentially for the town of Amherst to are the taxpayers willing to pick up the slack that three other towns may or may not fund on their own dime you know I think we have to be aware of those conversations and then the last thing I, I wanted to bring up is is it something that would be helpful to have some sort of outside person or group financial experts or government experts or something looking at our schools, but also our library and our, our municipal governments on where we're spending the money, whether it's in line or out of line with other communities of similar sizes, both at school sizes and municipal sizes or various municipals. I know Amherst doesn't quite have um, equals in terms of what our budget size is versus what our population size is. Those two don't really, there aren't too many towns in the Commonwealth that have similar budget plus populations together um, or even school plus, but you know, all of that. But but could would it be valuable for us to consider having someone come in to potentially be an outside advisor on where we might find efficiencies that isn't necessarily invested because they are employed by our, well, because they are in this town, you know, or elected by, you know, I've, I've got kids in the school or it's my own roads or this or that, someone that's a lot more neutral and dispassionate about what needs to be suggested or could be suggested because in some sense, they don't quite have that skin in the game that someone living here does. I'm not going to try to answer all your questions. <laughs> but you've raised some good ones. And I'm going to call on uh, school committee member, Irv Rhodes. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm late, but I had medical testing that took longer than it was supposed to take, in fact, one hour longer. Uh, anyway, I'm joining this conversation late, uh, so I don't know really what has been said, but just catching the drift of the comments that have been made so far, uh, it is is important for us, i.e., us, the school committee, the town council, the town manager, to be able to communicate very clearly to the citizens of this town, uh, uh, in general, and in particular to uh, the school community, uh, the structure of of our budget, how that budget uh, came to be. Uh, what our priorities are and how we make those priorities, how we generate those pr priorities. Uh, and, and, and that is really critical because a lot of people aren't in this room to know all the things that go into putting this budget together. And that needs to be clarified and communicated very clearly. Uh, and, and another note is that every year, uh, when uh, citizens uh, see that there are surpluses uh, and leftover money that hasn't been spent, uh, the, the, the question obviously, uh, which would be a good question, is why? Uh, and Sandy, I heard part of what you were saying, uh, and, 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 and part of that goes back to the way the budget is put together. And sometimes... And, and I really understand the position of a uh, the, the finance committee, the, the town manager, uh, and the, the director of finance in terms of being as conservative as possible because there are always unknowns that could crop up that will throw the budget out of kilter. However, when you get to the end and there's money just sitting there, uh, a citizen has, you know, really a good right to say why. And, and, and that why has to be answered in a very clear manner. By all of us, it needs to be answered very clearly. Why? Uh, because one could say, hey, rather than uh, being very conservative, why not be a little more not conservative and spend that money on needs that are clear and present? not spending that money uh, that are on these that are clear and present leaves me and other people to, to say 
why are we suffering when we don't really need to be suffering? And I know there's a balance there, but that balance has to be looked at carefully in relationship to all of the needs that are there, not only just from the schools, but from the town and the roads, and such as the library, et cetera. Those things have to be really explained carefully. I, for one, uh, look at the budget and I say, you know, um, and then the schools, because of who we are and how we are and how we operate, uh, there are some things that come up in our budget that we may have budgeted for, but for whatever reason, uh, it goes over. Uh, an example, special education. One child with specific special needs could throw that special education budget out of whack. And that special education budget is, is over 20% of our budget. So, so that, that, you know, it's sort of like no one needs to be in the blame game, but we all need to be in, in, in the game where we're saying, how can we do this in a more equitable manner and provide for the needs of the citizens in this town, especially our kids? You know, we, we just can't leave them hanging out there. And I know there's all kinds of criticisms that have been made in relationship uh, in terms of the school committee and our spending and our requests uh, coming late. But those requests coming late have to be balanced with, hey, uh, the uh, conservative spending plan that was put forward in the first place. They have to be balanced. You, you can't blame one without looking at the other. And I, and I think it'd be really, really, really good for us to sit down and come up with a realistic spending plan that will allow all of the various departments to be able to be fairly treated in regards to the priorities that they present to us. Thank you, Irv. Uh, Bob Pam. Library. Hi. Um, I'm going to make very minor uh, suggestions, but they might be helpful. Uh, in your budget projections, you show the pilot as being fixed all the way through for the next five years. Um, that basically holds them harmless from the things that everybody else is experiencing. So the question is whether pilots need to automatically be held at the same level. Second question is, um, I don't know what the percentage of OTPS is in our town budget. There are substantial changes in the uh, amount of energy that, that we are anticipating using over these coming years. It might be worthwhile to set some targets for how much we are doing and therefore trying to figure that as being something that we really need to think about as part of the budgeting process. My guess is that OTPS is a small portion of the budget, and so it's probably not going to make a large change, but it is something worth at least thinking about. Uh, third is um, what is being proposed here is essentially a supplemental budget in the last quarter of, this, of the year. That would have to basically mean that that in the fourth quarter there's a process and that it would be adopted you know, on or about May 1 uh, so that uh, if there was in fact going to be substantial amounts of uh, surplus funds, if you will, um, I don't know whether that would require a charter amendment, but it would be worth at least making sure that if you wanted to do that, that that, that piece of it was reviewed. And the fourth and last piece is that um, in the 2025 budget, uh, which is now balanced, um, that assumed that the library project would be moving forward um, essentially now by June 30th. Um, that has at best been delayed six months. I don't know what the effect of that is on um, interest charges in 2025 and consequently um, there may be some room in this budget for 2025, which would allow an alternative to doing it out of ARPA funds or other kinds of changes. Um, that's it.
Paul, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just want to raise while we have you, Sandy, because I know your time with the town is limited. I want to get your opinion on a few things. Um, three specifically. One of the suggestions that sort of alludes to what Bob said was to reduce the town's commitment to capital um, and what that change in policy, how that change in policy would impact. But that's a policy discussion, but thoughts on that. The second item was to reduce the town's commitment to OPEB in terms of what we put in every year and what you see as a potential impact of that through bond ratings or whatever. And then, well, let's start with those two and I have a, a third that I'd like to raise with you after you talk about those two. So um, I've always thought that it's a really great thing that Amherst has a committed amount to capital, uh, 10 or 10.5% 10 of uh, the tax levy, which comes out to about 6% of, of uh, your overall revenue, which I think is in line with other communities that have taken forward steps to make sure that they're funding capital at an adequate level. Um, so I think in general, it's important for the town to keep that commitment. I think the specifics of this year with the library project, if that were not to go forward, I think I would recommend keeping that money in capital and that money could be used uh, instead of borrowing for as much that is coming here for other projects, we could use some of that money to essentially borrow less for like say a DPW project or a fire project or whatever uh, to keep our total amount of capital spending the same and reduce the impact on capital budgets in future years. Um, so that's how I would look at it. Um, but again, I think the most important thing is Amherst's long-term commitment to capital spending is, is served the town very well. As to OPEB, um, I think um, the bond rating agencies want to see that the town is looking at its OPEB and its pension liabilities. They tend to look at it as one thing. Um, they like the fact that the town has been putting money toward OPEB because it shows the town understands and recognizes that that's something that's need, going to need to be dealt with. Um, and um, I think there are modest increases of $50,000 a year in our OPEB spending in the future budgets. Um, frankly, does it really make that much difference? No. Um, is it a nice sign to the rate bond rating agencies? Yes. Um, I think the most important thing is that the town be willing once you have fully finished, uh, funded your pension liabilities to then move a substantial amount of money that's now going into pensions into OPEB so that that's fully funded. So in a, in a reference point to that, when we did meet with the bond rating agencies, we did tout the town's continued commitment even during difficult times towards OPEB. They had, did recognize that. Um, and it isn't, you know, $50,000 isn't a make or break number, but the increasing allotment was something that they were pleased to see. Um, I have a couple true. other things. So one of the things was, you know, in terms of like the mortal sin for a town manager is to have a budget and deficit or a superintendent. Like that's a job ending decision. <laughs> so when we start sort of shaving these numbers down, you know, you will see resistance because it happens. It happens not infrequently. You see it in other districts and other towns where people get into trouble because something goes wrong and they're in deficit. And then the state comes in and you see it and they take over. And, you know, there are neighboring communities, in our, not neighboring, but communities in our area that are in unpetering like that because of um, lack of discipline living within our means. That's how I think of it, living within our means. So in parts of living within our means is to increase your revenue. And one of the things you talked about, Sandy, is one of the options was a was an override. And you have been through this multiple times in different communities. What are the, what groundwork, what, what are the facts on the ground that would lead to a successful override? Well, I think the most important thing is you have to have people, an organizing committee who's gonna work for that. Uh, and frankly, those are mostly in uh, other towns, the, the school people, frankly. Uh, 
that's a unified uh, constituency. The parents talk to each other, they get out the vote and so forth. And, but they need time to do it. I would doubt at this point that you could organize an, a good override campaign for a fall vote. I, that's why I said spring. You would have to talk to the people who have been behind civic engagements and you know the PTO or Amherst Ford or you know whoever's out there to ask them what they are prepared to do and when they are prepared to organize and uh, take uh, get some sense from them. All right, if we did something this fall, would you be ready to run a campaign? If we did something this spring, would you be ready to run a campaign? And then there's a lot of door knocking and, you know, coffees at people's house or conversations over play dates or birthday parties or whatever that would all just need to happen uh, for people to get the word out. And so you have to have sufficient time to do that. Um, so first you have to come up with some numbers within this group to decide how big the override needs to be. You then need to figure out timing and what the um, political side of it, which is outside of this group, you know, the staff can't participate in that, elected officials can, but um, but you really just then need to have an organized group out there who's gonna run the campaign. Paul, anything else? The, the only other thing is, um, I think you've talked about before, is that everybody needs to be on board. The elected leaders need to say, yes, we're all in. Not unanimous, but the community needs to say that all the officials have said, this is our path forward, because you're asking people to tax themselves more. The town has done it for capital, um, so we're experienced with that. But I think that um, it's a major decision to ask voters. And if you go in with a split model, like half the town wants it, it's not going to pass. Oh yeah, that that's what happened in Newton. What there was a split. I mean, Newton, you you figure a community that would support an override. It failed because there was organized opposition from some citizen groups, and there was a split among elected officials. And any time that happens, it's going to go down. So you have to ask for a number that you all feel comfortable with uh, and get behind. Um, Paul, anything else? Otherwise, Bob, your hand is still up. I don't know if you wanted to talk again or if I should go to other people. Uh, Andy, then. Yeah, there are several things that I've thought about as this conversation has gone along. One is, uh, since we were just talking about all, I think that we all have to recognize that uh, Amherst has uh, its own unique characteristics, one of which is that we already have very high taxes. Second is that we have a large number of retirees who are living now on fixed income and don't have kids in school and don't have investment. And so that the uh, school population percentage is probably less than the last time we did an operating override, which has been some years ago. Um, and uh, it's hard to know how that's going to play out in this particular uh, set of circumstances. There was discussion about uh, being more cautious on uh, budgeting or uh, not as cautious, however you want to want to view it, but um, trying to anticipate and not and not end up with the surpluses of the size that we. Um, people believe that we had, and I say believe because the uh, it, it's really been variable year from year. And so if you go back over a period of time, because factors that run into surpluses are not the same every year, and I think we would really need to make it a, um, a calculation of the size of the surplus in each year and see if we have really been that bad in our projecting, I actually don't think that we have. And in the years that we have had some very high surpluses, there have always been unique circumstances within 
the um, the budget process or, or the spending process that happened, either unexpected expenses or unexpected income that just could not have possibly been anticipated. And those are the years that we've had the very high uh, surpluses that come. I think that by and large, if we look at it, we we always want to end up to being on the correct side of the gas and as close as possible. And we've really done better than I think that we credited ourselves for being and how careful we are about budgeting. Um, and the, the last thing that I wanted to make is an observation, and this is based upon the discussions that we've been having with department heads on the municipal side in the past few weeks. Um, you know, vacancies has been what often drives the surpluses and vacancies is a big problem across um, in various departments. So uh, we were just talking to the police chief a couple of days ago about the number of uh, officers and the problems that come. And of course, that drives up their overtime when you get in, the, in schools and some places you hire substitutes. But um, it, uh, it, 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 it's also putting pressure on the hiring side and is going to put future pressure on um, what the municipal departments are going to need to pay to be competitive to remain in the market for being able to hire people. So I really um, am concerned about um, not making um, sunny projections of, of future uh, surpluses and uh, as being a solution to the problem or that it's going to uh, get better. I think that we are in a, in a situation we're just going to have to deal with. Well. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm I'm going to echo or agree with Andy. Um, I think we were amazingly fortunate this year to dodge a bullet of not having the mid-year cuts uh, come down from the state. Uh, I don't know how many of you have lived through that. I have, and it's brutal when somebody tells you six months into the year that you're going to lose, you know, a huge amount of money. Um, trying to find it is extremely tough. The fact that we made it through COVID at the level we did without having to go into our reserves is astounding to some extent. But the other piece that I just can't help but mention in this fiscal picture is the whole issue of our plans for future capital, capital expenditures. Because right now we are at such a low indebtedness that we're accumulating money, but we're not really spending that capital money. Once we start in on a new DPW, a new fire station, whatever we're going to do with the library, whether it's repair or, you know, whatever, um, we're going to see our debt payments go skyrocketing. And that at this point will also impact how we have to look at our budgets. Um, so I'm, this is not a, a rosy picture we're looking at now, but I think it could become even more difficult when you start looking at the debt we will have to start paying back as we increase our encumbrance and on debt because of buildings. Thank you. Or if you still have your hand up, did you want to talk again? I've raised my hand again, but uh, listening to the um, comments uh, in terms of debt uh, as, as it re relates to our, our, our uh, the town budget, I come back to the to the whole question of an override. It would seem to me that if if we were were seriously to consider an override, we would have to seriously consider not only its impact on spending throughout the town, 
But we'd also have to seriously consider that it cannot be an override for one thing. In other words, it, it could not just be an override just for the schools. Be because that that is something that, uh, A, in my mind, uh, would not be something that would be um, acceptable because there are other needs in the town also. I am really reminded of, of the process that just happened with the library and the bids coming in over what was supposed to be, uh, what it was supposed to be. And I'm reminded of that because we have yet to get in bids for the school. And we have no idea where that's going to happen, where that's going to find the experts are saying, well, no, it's going to be under a sector, but experts said the same thing for the library. So, so if we were, if, if, if I'm, if we were to consider an override uh, for the fall, by that time, uh, our bids would already have been in for the school. And if we were outside of that, I would want to, con I would want that to be a part of the override. I would not want to see it just sitting out there and say, we've got to make all kinds of reductions in relationship to uh, the school building. Uh, I would not want to see that happen. So we need to be careful. Uh, if we're going to really consider uh, an override, let's make sure we can include in that override all those things, present and future, that would need to be included uh, so that we do not have to go back to the town again. The other thing is budgets are, are, are we, we've set a budget uh, and budgets are concrete and they're set uh, for our operations. But the reality is on the operational side, it's fluid. And, and, and that fluidity is caused by a number of factors that are uh, for a large amount uh, uncontrolled and, un and, and we cannot control those things. We just can't, we, we might wish to do them, but we can't. And when those things that are uncontrollable are those but those things are unforeseeable in terms of budget, but we can foresee now in, in, in the upcoming fiscal year uh, and, the, and the year after that, that we are going to have some severe financial difficulties. We know that. So it would, would not be good for us to ignore that and say, well, we, you know, we, we can't get ready for an override we need to really get all of our fiscal data in place and information in place and go to the town for an override, which brings up the other thing. If the override were going to take place, uh, definitely would be would obviously be in November when the elections take place. That would be a good thing to do. Can we get prepared for that? I believe so. Uh, I, you know, I, I believe the town can mobilize itself, especially if we if that decision is made in the earlier part of the summer rather than the latter part of the summer, uh, because that would then give us September and October uh, to mobilize the population. I am you know, certainly mindful of the issues that uh, that would present to people like myself who are on fixed incomes, you know, family, other families in the same situation as I am. However, I, I believe that a strong enough case could be made in terms of not only just for the schools, but for other parts of the town budget that could be covered by that. The other thing is making it sustainable. It, it can't be a one and done thing. It has to be something that's sustainable for the schools to be looking at. And the last thing is, if we do that and override, Amherst is then fully prepared to fund this. But what does that mean for the other three towns? Are the other three towns going to be, in effect, asked to step up to where we are, which we can't control? We can't con can't control that, but certainly we need to make a strong ask of other towns to pay their fair share also. And if we lead that, uh, then we're we're actually going to be saying that because our our funding for schools certainly impacts the funding for of the other three towns. 
And that is a message that needs to be sent strong and clear. Uh, other towns are saying they're all for education. We are saying that. And if we are going to make that a priority among others, then we need to go about doing that sooner than later. If we're going to put out going for it override, which I would strongly recommend, uh, but I would not want to do it just for the schools. And I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of what happened at my daughter's school system where they went for an override just for the schools and it failed by eight votes. So I don't, I don't want us, the schools, to be standing alone on, on this. I want us to, uh, for the override to be not only just for the schools, but for other departments within the town. While we're talking about potential override options, um, I said earlier that I think we need to be looking at three or four percent growth. When I look at this four percent growth number, I think Sandy, you kind of uh, skated over how bad that is. As I start to sort of like internalize some of these numbers, you look at if we need to grow our functional areas at 4% a year, given revenues, at least the revenue um, potential numbers that are out there, and we know that they might fluctuate a little bit, but we're looking at two or 300,000 here or there, maybe on that fluctuation, certainly not multiple millions. We're looking at in four years needing six more million dollars in revenue. Um, Yes. Yeah. Northampton's Northampton's over mayor's budget override request, I think, was three million. Um, that would cover FY26 and FY27 only. Um, and then we'd be unless we banked 26 and then started using savings because of that banking, which I think some towns somehow do that. I don't know. So it depends on how people do it. It might also cover FY27, but I, we'd be, you know, I, I think the scale of the issue, if we're sitting in a situation where we need to be increasing, you know, with, with what Andy and Lynn said about, you know, what we've seen in finance of, and I think the schools have seen this too, salary numbers that are just not you know, positions going unfulfilled because there aren't people applying. We're not sure at this point whether that's because the salary is too low or whether there just aren't people in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> and it could be some of both. But if we start needing to increase salaries even above where they are now, those numbers are even worse. Um, and so, you know, it, the longer I sort of sit with this, the more I think we might need to ask for an override, no matter how much I, I I don't know whether it will be successful, but I think we need to come out and say reasons, just like Irv was saying, it's not just the schools, it's our municipal government too. But how big is that permanent? You know, our our school override passed, it's looking at, I think that was going to be 55 million over 30 years paying back. This would be you know, if you're just trying to get it to pay for the six million in FY29, you're looking at six million within 10 years, it's been the same increase as that school is, but over 30 years, it's triple the increase of the school in a sense. If 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 my back of the head math sort of kind of works out, you know, um, we're not looking at a small override if we want to not ask for one for at least a decade. I've lived here over a decade and I haven't faced an operating override. Um, the last one I think was you know, 15 years ago maybe, but a 15 year, some, an override that might last 15 years is a substantial number. Uh, it's not 3 million that Northampton asked for. And I think we have to face that fact too, that we would be looking at substantial increases in in property taxes not small increases well and i do think what you 
need to do is start running those scenarios so you see what the numbers are. Um, Paul, did you want to say something? Yeah, so it just, um, so before Jen LaFountain left, um, had to leave, she wanted to note that the school building override starts to hit taxpayers in FY25. So those increased tax bills are going to be landing in people's mailboxes this, this in FY25. Lynn, I'm going to turn this back over to you to run the meetings. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say thank Jen for that because um, I can just imagine getting a request for an override about the same time our taxes go up $600 a year uh, minimum. Um, so are there any other questions or comments? Are there any kind of concluding things that people would like to see as next steps? Because we've heard a couple. One is if we were going to do look at an override, how big would it need to be and to cover what period? Uh, the other one I think we're looking at, at least from my perspective, is that missing piece of what happens when we start spending significant capital on big projects. Um, are there others that we, as a group, are kind of asking for? I don't see any. Um, Mandy Jo, Councilor Haneke. I think we were, at least I was looking for, you know, I, I I finally found what part of the website all of the quarterlies are. It was, it was in, um, it wasn't in the treasurer collector, it was in accounting um, and it's not under budget. It's like in areas that it took me four or five different main pages to find, but there, some of it's there. I think it would be very helpful to, to get it figure out a way to sort of be able to see it on one or two sheets instead of in, in a way that allows us last year's I, I'm particularly concerned about the revenue side not the expenditure side because I understand why expenditures might produce lower expenditures than budgeted hence than um, surpluses in a sense um, but the revenue surplus for the last couple of years has been over two million um, which is not huge on a $88 million budget, but it's not small either um, on, on a one or two position level too, right? You know, depending on how you're looking at it. And so I would love for a group to be able to start digging into, is it, is, are those 2 million surpluses caused as Andy potentially believes that maybe, or has suggested that it might be each year's for a different reason that is one time, um, or is there sort of a recurring line that is consistently bringing in more than budget? Um, and what what might that line be so that we can maybe do that? I know that also doesn't solve the problem, but I think if whether it, it might be BCG that needs to meet more regularly once a month to start doing these and having these conversations about if there were, you know, if the count, if the BCG or the school committees or anyone was going to ask the council to put or the council itself to put an override on a ballot, someone needs to have those conversations. And given that that override affects all areas, it's probably BCG initially um, to talk about some of those. So maybe more regular meetings here with the two things Lynn suggested, plus this like revenue picture that some of us are interested in um to start exploring a little more um it, it, you know Mandy Joe it seems to me on your revenue request that looking at it over a number of years and see if there's areas where we have consistently underestimated our revenue whether there's areas in which we have consistently un, under budgeted or over budgeted um so that we're looking for trends yeah. to see whether those are the way to do that so I'm hearing those three things is there anything else? And I'm also hearing a suggestion that this group meet more regularly, uh, which uh, seems appropriate, especially since, at least from the perspective of the town council, uh, we always try to have at least two members from our finance committee on this group, and we do this year as well. Um, 
Any other comments on this Friday afternoon? It's turning into a beautiful evening. A uh, Thursday afternoon, excuse me. It's only Thursday. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to ask for a motion to, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Seek a second. I'll second. Second. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'm going to just quickly ask you to vote in terms of adjournment. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, aye. Bob Pam. Aye. Sarah Marshall. Aye. Irv Rhodes. Aye. Thank you. Have a good day. We're adjourned. <laughs>